All right, guys, everybody gather in. We're about to get started. Thank you for coming out tonight. Welcome to our very first Airbnb Design Talks. Uh, let's round of applause, come on, get it going. So this is the very first in a series that we're gonna start this year. Um, and this is a special series for us, uh, particularly this year. The theme this year is about how artists connect, protect, and preserve community through their work. So tonight we have a special guest. Before we introduce them, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some of the people that we've invited out tonight. So we have some people here from Neon SF, uh, and they have provided some gifts from us. So stick around until the end, we're gonna hand those out. We also have some students from CCA that we've invited. We're gonna try to include the academic community and invite students out to these events. Um, and then we have Todd. Uh, Todd is a really amazing and special artist that we had the pleasure of meeting last year at South by Southwest when we were in Austin. He invited us into this incredible workspace. I only saw pictures, I unfortunately didn't get a go. Um, but it's incredible workspace slash gallery where he assembles his work. And one thing to realize about his work is right behind me is a piece. And as we were prepping for this event, he sent us some pictures and he said, this is one of my smaller works. So I imagine this being about a foot and a half tall, hard to see, get that context on the internet. And then lo and behold, he arrives yesterday with this gigantic custom built shipping box and this massive piece. It's hard to get a sense for scale, but it's about five and a half feet tall. So this is one of the smaller pieces, gives you a sense of the scale that he's working in. And he's gonna come up tonight and talk about the work that he's done, how he got into it, and how it connects to communities how it kind of helps preserve the idea of uh, and the identity of some of these places that he's working. Um, so no further ado, I wanna to welcome Todd Sanders up to the stage. How you guys doing? I, um, I'm very honored to be here and I'm, I'm tickled to get to talk about something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I hope after I finish speaking with you that some of the passion I have rubs off and, and you get to, uh, to, to experience a little bit of what I get to experience. Um, when you love old neon signs, you, when you're, you take a road trip, it just makes it a little more fun to, to notice them. Even driving around your own town here, um, it, it makes it a, a, a de deeper experience to get to see all the neon signs around. Um, I highly suggest you guys take the neon sign tour that is in San Francisco. I wish we had one in Austin and we don't. Um, but uh, I've walked all over San Francisco in the last couple of days and I've been blown away with some of the neon here. It's, uh, it's really just been a great part of my experience here. Um, but what is neon? I mean, I just turned this on and it's plugged into the wall and it glows, but it, it's like, what makes it do that? Well, in 1898, these two Swedish chemists suspected that there were gases in the atmosphere, um, neon and other noble gases, argon, xenon, helium, and you're actually breathing neon right now. It's uh, not much, it's 0.00046% of the atmosphere. But, and people suspected that it was there, but no one had any idea how to get it out of the atmosphere and contain it. And these guys hit upon an idea uh, to liquefy the atmosphere, to turn the atmosphere liquid and then through a process called fractional distillation, they froze this liquefied atmosphere and a certain temperature, they scraped off the impurities and the oxygen and the nitrogen. And I don't know how they did it in 1898, but at negative 246 degrees centigrade, they isolated neon and froze it and put it in its own container 
And then when it thawed out, <clears throat> they decided to hit it with an electrical charge and see what happened. And they almost fell out of their chairs. It just glowed this bright red crimson color. And um, it, it blew them away. They didn't know what to expect. And they, uh, they were all really surprised. But it, it just kind of stayed in the laboratory of something to kind of show off to your uh, to the other chemists and scientists. It was just kind of a novelty. And then in 1910, this guy from Paris named George Claude saw it. And he said, you know, there might be a commercial application for this. I think if the, the neon gas wasn't just contained in a small container, but was in a tube, the tube could be bent into the shape of a word or a picture, and then the neon introduced into the tube and an electrical charge added to it. And um, I, I think this could work as uh, a, an advertising medium. So um, he started really studying how to do this, and he invented the, the, the crucial link was the electrodes on the end that sent the electrical charge through the glass. Uh, he invented the non-corroding electrode. And so in 1915, he patented neon, the luminous tube as an advertising medium. He actually owned the patent, and if you wanted a neon sign, you had to give him mailbox money or you didn't get one. And so um, the first neon sign that ever existed was for a, a Paris barber shop, and then uh, Cinzano Vermouth wanted a, a, a whole campaign of neon signs, so these really big uh, neon Cinzano signs came into being. At one time, the entire underside canopy of the Eiffel Tower was covered in neon tubing. Um, I would have loved to have seen that. That would have really be something to see. Uh, and, and neon was really considered not just modern, but really elegant. And it, it, it carried this really great persona with it, but it mostly was just relegated to being in Europe. And then in 1923, a Packard motor car dealership owner from Los uh, Angeles vacationed in Paris, and he saw the neon signs, so he ordered two Packard neon signs to be shipped to America, and when he installed them on his building and plugged them in, it stopped traffic and it created a, a scene that the, the police had to come out for crowd control. It was it, it actually just blew everyone away, and uh, <clears throat> neon was off. It was in America, and of course, just like typical American spirit, we took it and made it our own art form. We uh, started doing animated neon signs with cartoon neon images of dancing girls and fish swimming and stuff. And in fact, some of the first cartoons that anyone ever saw was neon signs animated that predated Steamboat Willie, Mickey Mouse by a few years. And it was in black and white and neon was in color. So. Um, Neon is actually the, a red gas, but and, and the whole industry is called neon signs, but a lot of the gas you see, the gold and the white and blues, that's argon. Um, it just it gets the name of a neon sign, but it's uh, technically a lot of it is argon gas. And with argon, they put a tiny drop of mercury inside the glass tube and it vaporizes and intensifies the blue light. Uh, so, so the 1920s, 1930s, those were just kind of a heyday of, of great neon sign design that um, the Times Square came from that era when some neon signs were several stories tall and several tons. 
uh, and things were going along really great until World War II, and there were rules passed that you had to turn all the neon signs off for the duration of the war. You could see a neon sign from an airplane, uh, uh, if an enemy airplane was attacking, that <clears throat> they would see the neon. So the, all of the neon signs went dark from 1941 to 1945. At that time, they were doing uh, scrap drives for rubber and metal, and a real popular scrap drive was for neon signs to be taken down, crushed, melted down, and it's kind of like the old uh, turn your plows into plowshares into swords, will turn your neon signs into bombs and jeeps. Um, so a lot of the signs from the 1920s and 30s were destroyed for the war effort. Uh, they, the, finally, the, the World War II was over, and in my opinion, the immediate post-war years of 1946 to the early 1950s were the kind of the golden era of American neon sign design. But by the early 1950s, there was a new product that was replacing neon, and it was the plastic box with fluorescent tubes inside. I, I personally think these things are like vandalism on the landscape, but um, I don't even have a picture here to show you because I don't even want to own a picture of one. But so, uh, but neon started getting the reputation of being seedy and garish and just just for strip clubs and beer joints and uh, in full disclosure this seedy and garish neon sign is one of my works of art so um, but it, for illustrative purposes I put it up here so uh, the plastic boxes with the fluorescent bulbs started really taking on and neon became vilified. There was even laws passed against neon signs in communities. But it wasn't just that neon was falling out of favor. It had helped the plastics industry and the petroleum industry spent a lot of money to vilify neon and to make it the, the villain that they were trying to make it into. <clears throat> And so neon began, began its decline that in the 19, late 1950s into the 1960s, they had a program again, just like during World War II, called SOS, Scrap Old Signs. And they would take a fleet of crane trucks through a city and cut neon signs off of buildings. They, uh, this article that I got this photo from, they cut 150 neon signs down and packed them up in a dumpster and destroyed them and crushed them. And then they, people started wondering why the downtowns were dying. Well, it was because of a few factors, like one was the highways bypassing the downtowns and people moving to suburbs. But a big factor that involved with that whole dying of the the Main Street and communities falling into disrepair was the fact that the downtowns didn't glow with neon anymore. And so uh, the, the, the neon craftsmen that came up in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, they were constantly passing down their information on the new guys that were coming up. Well, in the 1950s, the new guys had no desire to learn about neon. <clears throat> they wanted to build plastic boxes with fluorescent bulbs inside them. And so all of this knowledge was lost. These guys slowly retired and went away. And this knowledge went away with them. And um, I've spent the last 25 years trying to regain as much of that knowledge as I possibly could. I, I met the surviving neon artists that I could find. I bought old neon signs and reverse engineered them, disassembled them. I, um, I even bought an old 
the contents of an old neon sign shop that started in the 1930s and ended in the 1980s. And in some boxes in that shop were several old signed trade journals called Signs of the Times. And this information was still in there. And so I read cover to cover every single one I could find. The ones I didn't have, there was one, one a month, you know, and this started in the late 30s, but the, the, a lot of them were missing. I bought on eBay, and some of them I've spent over $100 for one magazine. I've, I've got thousands of dollars invested in these magazines. But I kind of I liken myself to, I like to call myself a neon archaeologist. I've, I've pulled all this old information as much as I possibly could back out, and I've, I've learned it, and I've applied it to my own craft. Um, so, but during this time, neon kind of, uh, it, it did go away from the, the landscape and signage and, and all of that, but um, it started getting picked up by fine artists. Even in the 1960s, Bruce Nauman was doing uh, fine art with neon, uh, Lily Lockich, Stephen Antonakos, these guys kind of kept neon going in a strange way. It was just uh, made into fine art. But a lot of old neon signs held in there, the, just the old antique ones, and they became cultural icons in a community. Uh, people took a lot of pride in them and they became part of what made people love the city. The uh, huge Pegasus in Dallas is a great example, and this sign has been working for the last probably 75 years, and it's hard to imagine the Dallas skyline without this sign. Uh, even smaller towns, Waco, Texas, had this piece. It was uh, Leslie's Chicken Shack. You could see this sign for five miles away, and it became a, a big part of Waco's identity. Uh, <clears throat> I found out that this sign, this entire building was going to be torn down. This sign was coming down with the building. And so I rushed to Waco to talk to them about it, and they said, yeah, you can have the sign for free, but it's going to be $2,000 in crane truck fees to... Uh, to take it down, and I didn't have it. So I talked the crane truck company into letting me give them $100 a month for 20 months. And so I am probably the only person in history that paid off a 20-foot chicken on the installment plan. <laughs> but this is my backyard of my studio, and this is the Waco Chicken Shack chicken that um, I've rescued this piece. I've rescued other antique signs from Central Texas, and they're all on display in my backyard of the studio that I work at now. But a lot of people come by, if they're from Georgia, and they see this chicken, they say, oh, we've got a chicken too. And this is like an iconic chicken in Atlanta, Georgia. His beak opens and closes, and his eyes do googly things. He's 54 feet tall. and it used to, when it started out, it was Johnny Reb's Chicken Restaurant, and now it's a Kentucky Fried Chicken. But people use this for direction. They say, like, oh, where do you live? I, I live, go, go right past the Big Red Chicken and take a left. And so, it, and again, it's, these things are very important parts of, of communities, and um, a lot of times they're even taken for granted, but... When they do go away, I even notice some the, the, the antique signs in Austin. <clears throat> Every now and then, I'll drive by and like, oh man, that thing's gone, and it it, it kind of to me looks like a, a missing tooth in someone's smile. It, it's just like really obvious that it's not there anymore. Um, neon has experienced a new resurgence in popularity, it's become really popular again as an advertising medium. But at the same time, there's a new product on the horizon that's really threatening it. It's uh, LED lighting. And 
a lot of the materials that I buy to create my works are getting harder to find because the, the, the manufacturers of the, the, the supply companies are going out of business or ch switching to LED lighting materials. And so um, it's, it's getting kind of harder to find certain parts th that I need to, to make these signs. They're, they're all made brand new from scratch. It looks like something that's beat up and weathered and really old, but this piece is a week old. I just finished it before I got here. Uh, so I really don't know what the future is for neon. I do know that it'll have more rises and more falls, but neon will never go away and there will never be anything to replace neon. It's something that speaks to the core of people. It's actually the color of a campfire and it, it speaks to a more primitive part of the, the, the human the psyche, um, the aurora borealis is basically a neon sign lit up in the sky. It's, it's it, all of the noble gases ignited by electricity. So we've been seeing, technically in a certain part of the world, we've been seeing a neon sign glow for millions of years. Um, so neon will never go away. It, it's, it's, it, it's something that I think, uh, uh, like I said, it'll it'll kind of have its ups and downs, but there's nothing that'll ever really replace it. So basically, that's the history of neon itself. Um, I'm, uh, now I'm, I'd like to tell you a little bit of history about me. And um, <clears throat> this handsome rascal here is me at two years old. Uh, some of my earliest memories are of neon. There was a this neon clock and it had a pink ring and an orange ring and I, when I was a little bit older I would remember seeing this as a little kid and I was trying to remember like where was this and then my dad moved to Riverside Texas and I went to visit him one day and when I was leaving that night I turned on this farm to market road and saw this neon clock that was in my memory and so I asked him like I remember this old clock, uh, you know, and he said, we lived in this area when you were two years old. And so neon's been affecting me since I was a little two-year-old boy. Um, something else as a little boy, I wanted to be an artist. We had these uh, books when I was a little kid, and they're called School Days, and you put your report card and paste your... Uh, school photo on it and you write who your best friends are and I, they always said every school year it said when I grow up I want to be and I would write artists every year um, I just had all the confidence in the world that I was going to become an artist when I grew up and uh, I even <clears throat> did I, I drew every day and I just uh, even when all the other boys started doing sports and different things I, I kept up with art I just knew I was gonna just be a an artist someday and as I got older and got ready to <clears throat> finish high school and, and embark on all this I kind of I started getting a lot of influence from people that loved me and cared about me but really discouraged me from becoming an artist uh, the only thing they could equate with artist is you'd, you'd be a starving artist. I'm honestly the fattest starving artist you'll ever meet. Um, but I, I listened to them and I, I lost my confidence. And, but I, I wanted to still do something that was in the art world, just that I could tell the folks back home was a practical job. And so I enrolled in a graphic design and advertising program. Uh, I, I did two years in a graphic design school in Houston, and then two years in Huntsville at uh, Sam Houston State University. And uh, to pay my way through college, I started painting signs, another kind of art thing that I could do that sounded really practical. And so I started painting signs for ranches and little shops downtown and antique stores. 
and re fell in love with like type and all of that again, I, I, especially crafting my own type styles. It's something I really got excited about. Then one day, I, my buddy and I took a road trip to New Braunfels and um, we loaded everything up in my yellow VW thing. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a VW thing. They look like a dumpster with wheels on it and uh, loaded everything up in there. And we were supposed to go to Bastrop, Texas, and then just outside of Bastrop, turn on Highway 21 and go down to New Braunfels. And uh, we're yakking along, not even paying attention. And I come over the hill and realize I see the Austin skyline. And I'm like, oh man, we missed our turn. This was the best missed turn in, in my whole life. And uh, so I said, well, let's, let's drive around Austin for a little bit and we'll go to New Braunfels later on this, this evening. And so we come wheeling into Austin in this clown car and um, start driving around. And I, I just I started getting this feeling for the city and saw some girls with tattoos all over them. And in East Texas, you had to go to the carnival to see that, you know, like it was like, wow, I love this city, you know, this is cool. And um, I started noticing all the old neon signs in town. And I, I just was falling in love with Austin just driving through in this car. And then at 12th and Lamar, I saw this sign. And it blew me away. It's, it's everything I love about neon signage. It's even got a 3D weird bug on top of it. And uh, so I told my buddy, I know exactly what I'm going to do now. And he's like, what, be an exterminator? I'm like, no, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to Austin, and I'm going to build neon signs. And uh, he's like, yeah, right. And that's exactly what I did. I went back home and uh, quit college, loaded all my stuff up in an old 1954 Spartan travel trailer and uh, pulled it to Austin and uh, had just a few hundred dollars on me and parked it in a trailer park. And so I set out to all the sign shops in town looking for one that I thought would be a good fit. And most of them were making plastic boxes with fluorescent bulbs. And I'm like, uh, you know, I don't, wanna, I don't really want to do that. And then I pulled into this one little small sign shop that was owned by a husband and wife called Ion Art, I-O-N Art. And when I walked in, they had a little art gallery off to the side and then a commercial sign shop. And they worked strictly with neon signs. They didn't do any, anything else. Um, so I was like, yeah, this is where I want to work. All right. So I walked up to the owner and I said, hey, uh, I want to get a job here. And they said, no. <laughs> I'm like, what? I couldn't believe it, you know? And so I'm like, okay. So I came back the next day. And the day after that, and the day after that, I would come in and the neon vendor would look at me and go, he's back, you know? And I'm like, I made it a point. I was either going to get hired or they were going to get a restraining order against me, but I'm, I'm going to work here, you know? So I finally wore them down and they said, look, we, we just got this big job and we only need you for two weeks. And I worked there for three years and uh, learned everything I could about neon. I was just super passionate about it. And I'm, honestly, I, I learned enough about bending neon to know I don't want to bend neon. It's, it's really something that is super hard to do. The guys that I don't bend my own neon, I've got a guy that bends it for me. The, these guys are heroes in my life. They, they, when you watch them bend neon, they make it look so easy. And it is super, super hard to do. It takes years of practice to before you can even make a a piece that you can sell. So, um, so I got into the designing and the metal work and the painting and all of that. And I did all the patterns. And, and um, but this was the the early 1990s. So it was a lot of. Uh, brushed aluminum and black plexiglass and stuff like the, the the 90s style and it was it was neon and it was fun but one day this guy came in and was opening a Cajun restaurant and he wanted some vintage style neon signs 
for the interior, just for decor. And he, one that he wanted was a Jack's beer sign. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. You know, I was, I got this job to, from the, uh, there were other guys working there. I was like, I want to, I want to do this job. So I started building this sign. I, I, I found an old photo of a real Jack's beer sign. And so I kind of imitated it. And when I was making this sign, it was in the, the old style. The guy wanted it weathered. And I was like, I felt like, like, I was on vacation making this piece, and when it was finished and we installed it and I went back to the <clears throat> black plexiglass and aluminum, I felt like I had just came back from vacation and went back to work again. So I knew, like, this is the style I want to work in. And it really wasn't that popular overall, so I, um, but I didn't care. I wanted to do it. So after three years, I went out on my own and I started a business creating vintage neon signs as commercial signage for businesses. It was the first sign company of its kind ever that, that focused on the vintage style design and I called it Roadhouse Relics. I, um, I didn't have a, a shop at the time, I lived in a trailer park but I noticed there was an old uh, laundromat that had been torn down and this cement slab with all these drain holes in it. I made a deal with the uh, owner of the trailer park to let me build a little small shop. So the very first roadhouse relics was in, in a trailer park. Um, and then I found out the trailer park was being sold and turned into a Walgreens. So uh, I set out looking for my permanent location and I saw this place on South First in pretty kind of bad neighborhood at the time and fell in love with it. It was an old grocery store from the 1930s or 40s and uh, sometime in the 80s the roof had collapsed and so they just closed up the grocery store but they lived in an old trailer in the backyard and one guy was left and he lived there. He was a really old man. And I approached him and he just screamed and cussed me out and ran me off and said he's not selling it. And so um, I just happened to find out sometime later that uh, he had passed away and his daughters were putting it up for sale. And so I got an earnest money contract on it, but they wanted all cash on the deal. So I asked for 45 day feasibility period. And I set out looking for an investor. I looked everywhere. I talked to every banker, every, people, people that I knew thought I was nuts for getting this place. They thought I was like, I had lost my mind because it was in such bad shape. But on day 41 of 45 day period, I found an investor and he agreed to buy it and sell it back to me um, just monthly with monthly payments. And so in January 1997, I moved in and took the rest of the broken down roof off. And I worked just like that for two years with no roof. I knew I couldn't afford to run up payments and run up a credit card. I've, I've never had a credit card in my life and I'm almost 50. I've never made a car payment in my life. I've through this whole time I was driving thousand dollar little hoopties and, and that's all I could afford. So that's all I, I drove, but I slowly saved up enough money to put a roof on the, the building and then slowly saved up enough money to buy an air conditioner. And I did a lot of the work myself, but I had to make neon signs also. So I really put my personal life on hold for a lot of years. And, um, but I fixed the place up. This is what it looks like today. And um, throughout this whole time, I, uh, I continued making neon signs. And then I also restored neon signs. This is the State Theater in Austin and me pretending that the three-story tall sign is a buck and bronco. Um, but I traveled all over the, the state restoring old neon signs. I even did a TP Motel sign one time in Wharton, Texas. But um, in, my, in my 
studio, I, I started a tiny little corner that was a gallery, and I started making art pieces, mostly that they were used as movie props and restaurant decor, but um, I made this piece, and this pretty girl came in one day, and she had just moved here from Canada and bought this piece, and I was like really taken with her immediately. I was like, wow, man. And so I asked her out, and um, we started dating. We, we dated for two years, and I knew, like, this is the girl I want to spend the rest of my life with. And Neon brought us together, so I proposed with a neon sign. And she said she'd think about it. No, <laughs> no she said, yeah. I actually thought about putting yes and no in neon, and she could click the switch, and then I was like, I'm not giving her an out, you know, like. And um, so she, this was 2007. Um, being married to Sarah gave me the confidence and all of her encouragement to actually do what I wanted to do as a little boy, which was uh, be an artist strictly an artist and quit lying to myself and kidding that I'm going to make art on weekends and build neon signs. <clears throat> so in 2007, I closed the commercial sign aspect of my business and I focused strictly on creating neon as art. And um, I've been at it now for nine years. I haven't made a neon sign that has gone up anywhere in Austin. And for a couple of years after I made this decision and closed that part of my business, I didn't make much money for a couple of years. And then the New York Times did an article about me and my gallery and that it's a must-see place in Austin. And um, things took off. It, it, finally, it finally hit, and so I, uh, I have done work for celebrities. Uh, this is Willie. I, I, he wanted five pieces for a concert he had at his ranch, and he just wanted to rent them. So I made five pieces, and then uh, at the end of it, I went to pick them up. I drove up with my trailer, and he's like, come here, boy, and I want to talk to you. And uh, after that talk, I went home with a pocket full of money and an empty trailer, and he bought all five. He took them all. I've done work with Billy Gibbons, and uh, this is my beautiful family. And I also snuck in a picture of my truck. That's my shop truck, and um, I had to get a picture of it in here somewhere. But I've worked with Billy. Um, I actually had the honor of doing a sign for his album cover for ZZ Top. Uh, this led to an album cover for the Kings of Leon. There's a... Um, documentary on my website about me making this. It's only like five minutes long. It's on roadhouserelics.com. But in uh, 2015, I got gallery representation at a gallery called Samuel Owen. There's one in Nantucket and another in the Hamptons. And um, Samuel Owen carries Mr. Brainwash, if you've seen uh, Exit Through the Gift Shop. Andy Warhol, Shepard Ferry, Damien Hirst, and me. So I'm like super proud that I get to be in the company of those. Thank you. I'm, I'm really proud to be in the company of those guys. Um, but the next few photos I'm gonna show you are gonna be sketches and then photos of the finished piece. This is one I did for Willie. Um, when you, it, it's like a motel sign. It actually, you can make it say legal or illegal, like vacancy or no vacancy. And so he preferred it to say legal, so we left the ill off. This is a piece that's uh, reminiscent of the Big Tex Cowboy in Dallas at the uh, State Fair. It, um, I entered it in a national neon sign design contest and uh, took home an award. Um, this is a piece that's in Shepard Ferry's office that I created for him. And then these are just, these are open edition pieces that I've created and put in the gallery. The one behind me, the, the luchador, is actually 
uh, limited edition piece. Um, there'll only be five of these, and this is number five of five. After this one sells, there won't be another red luchador like this. Um, I've done some white ones, and I'm doing a green one, and I'm going to do like green, white, and red, and like a Mexican flag. I have all three of them, like a triptych on the wall. But um, these are just fun little pieces that I create. This is one that actually has an animated fly that buzzes around and then the, the frog zaps his tongue out and catches the fly. Um, this one I included just to show kind of a close up of some weathering techniques that I like to employ. Uh, this is a crackle finish on the surface that I've perfected. Um, making neon signs is something that the old guys knew, but they didn't really have to learn the weathering. I, I had to not only learn the neon sign design, but I also had to learn how to weather them in a week to look like something Mother Nature did in 50 or 60 years. And uh, that's really what kind of sets these apart is the weathering. This is a piece that I, uh, this is Mercury, and I made it for a really iconic club in Austin called the Continental Club. And Johnny Depp came to the Continental Club one day and saw it and bought two of these from me. I created this for Robert Rodriguez's uh, Grindhouse movie. I've done several of Robert Rodriguez's movies, and um, I've done uh, Miss Congeniality, I worked on, uh, I did some pieces for Boyhood, the uh, Richard Linklater movie. If, if you guys haven't seen that movie, it's a, it's a work of art. Um, two Terrence Malick films, one called Tree of Life, I've worked on them. They're really exciting to get to work on a movie and be on a movie set and stuff and meet cool people. Uh, this, this is a piece that is kind of the new direction that I'm going in. It's it looks like it's been unbolted from a much bigger sign and it's kind of boiled down to just the essence of, of it, it's not the whole piece, it's just a small section, but it's, it's, it's art. Um, this is one I did for uh, Miranda Lambert and Blake Shelton's wedding. It's animated so that fireflies buzz around inside the mason jar. I created this piece with Shepherd Fairy. Uh, I made two of them and uh, we showed it at a show in Charleston, South Carolina, along with Jasper Johns. They're both from um, Charleston, and so uh, they had a show together, and I was, I was honored to get to be a part of that. So this is the inside of my gallery. Um, I really am super lucky to get to do what I'm doing. I, um, I'm, I make my living at art, and I feed my family with art, and it's the most rewarding thing in the world, but it's also the most terrifying all the time. And um, I've realized that if you're not scaring yourself, you're really not living all the way. You've got to kind of get out there and really scare the hell out of yourself sometimes to make uh, life really exciting. Um, I knew someone that did hospice care and she said all these people were in bed and they were never getting out of that bed again and they knew it and every one of them had some dream that they didn't pursue and all they could think about was like I'm never getting out of here again I'm, I'm this is the end of my life and all I, I wish I had taken the chance and done this thing and when she told me this story I put myself in that bed 50 or 60 years in the future and I asked myself what would you regret not doing and it's making art and being an artist and so that's what I'm doing here and uh, I hope to keep doing it a whole lot longer I'm um, uh, really excited to get to talk to you about all this. And I, if you're ever in Austin, this is my place. It's uh, Roadhouse Relics on South First Street. This mural is something I painted with a couple of other artists, and it's become a real iconic image uh, that people take photos of all the time. And um, I want to thank you for giving me the chance to speak today. And we're going to go to a kind of a question period, so I thought this would be a good 
piece that uh, to put up. This, this is something that excites me. It's um, it looks really old, but there's no way it can be because it's a modern phrase. And it, it, I love watching people's heads get kind of turned. They're like, "Wait a minute, that can't be old." You know, it's, it says WTF on it. So, um, but thank you very much. Thanks so much, Todd. Um, so we're, before we open up to questions, I wanted to ask you a couple questions to kind of get the conversation going. And then we're going to invite the audience to, uh, to contribute any questions that you have for Todd. Uh, I can't see a thing, so I'm going to ask you guys to maybe shout my name when I call on you. So this idea of coming into art, you came up as a child wanting to be an artist, and you kind of gone away from that, maybe lost your confidence in your ability to be an artist. Why, of all things, did you choose to start with metal and glass and noble gas? I grew up in um, my dad's workshops. He was a welder and a painter and a fabricator, and I, I loved working with my hands. And going to graphic design school, I realized that, that there's no way I'm going to be able to sit in an office. I can't even sit in class and do this. You know, there's no way I'm going to be able to sit in an office and just work on a computer. <clears throat> so I wanted to do something that I could work in a workshop with my hands. Neon, I, it, it almost it feels like I didn't have the option of not doing neon. It's something that really affects me deeply. and. Uh, it's something I wanted to make a part of my life. And what's kind of funny is if I had the confidence early on to be an artist, I probably wouldn't be doing the neon. I went into the neon as kind of the long way around, but it, it's really been a great journey because I'd spent decades learning the craft and then applied it to my art and turned it into pop art. It's the collision between co commercial and fine art, and um, but it, it required a, lo a lot of years of learning, and um, I don't know if I would have done that if I had the confidence early on, so it, uh, it, it, everything worked out perfectly the way it did. Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting. I wanted to, to share a little bit of an anecdote that I think gets at kind of that cross between commercial and identity and, and emotion and all these things that are tied up together um, and not necessarily separable. I had a friend who had gone to, uh, to North Korea and he came back and I asked him what the most stark and surprising thing was. And he said, North Korea has government regulations for all their signage. All their signage is exactly the same. Restaurant, 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 groceries, 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 whatever it is. Um, and he said, that lack of identity He's like, when without that kind of commercial and, and brand presence, there's not a sense of identity of the place. So I, I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on kind of how that commercial ties into people's emotional connection to a place. It, um, it really ties into a place, and certain cities actually have their own neon identity. I can look at a sign from New Orleans and tell it's from New Orleans. I can look at a sign from Chicago. New York signs are very rec recognizable. New York with stain, uh, stainless steel and double stroke neon that's really tight. There, no one else makes signs that way. Even Sacramento has its own neon style. Um, but what you said about the regulations in North Korea, that's kind of happening and a lot, of, a lot of strip centers and things have sign criteria that don't allow you to deviate from their, from their rules and um, it, it shows, I mean, it, you really kind of pick up on it. So I, I kind of have tried to make early on <clears throat> Austin to be something that had its own kind of identity to it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's super interesting. I, I want to do one more question, then we'll open up to the audience. 
Yeah, you know, you said at one point you said neon in some of your later work was a way for you to take an idea and boil it down to an essence. And I think that what I've seen looking at your work and looking at neon, looking at the kind of work that's displayed in, in LA's Neon Museum, is it really does become, for some reason, above all else, these signs, these lights become a representation of, of the things that happened at this place and the emotions that are associated there. One of the pieces at the, at, at the museum in LA is for a restaurant called the, the Holiday Bowl in LA. And I guess this restaurant had been a critical spot, a critical place uh, during the desegregation of LA. And they were famous for serving chow mein and grits and hamburgers and udon. And their menu was multicultural and it brought multicultural audience and, and community there. And that's where a lot of people met and that's where a lot of the community activists started. And that sign is the only remaining piece. That's the essence, like you said, it's all there in that sign. Yeah, that, it's, um, it, it's, it's kind of amazing how that works out, you know, like uh, signs sometimes are, are the, uh, the only souvenir that's left of a place. The whole place is torn down like the Leslie's Chicken Shack, that whole place is gone. So the sign is the only thing that remains. So um, it's, um, it's luckily people are respect, uh, like admiring them enough to, to save them like that, but that, that's a great story that that sign was saved because a lot of places that are iconic like that, you only, if you're lucky, you have a photograph of it, but some of them are lost to history. Right. I, one of my most memorable quotes I wrote down from the night was 20 foot chicken on the installment plan. <laughs> I'm gonna remember that. Anyone in the audience have any questions? You got someone over here? It's a mic, that cube is a microphone. <laughs> so I'm like hearing impaired, this is so cool. Okay, hi, so I'm Sarah, I'm a student at CCA and I'm studying graphic design, but my background is painting. And the question I have for you is how do you deal with doing a 2D and 3D surface because you ha are painting and then you're thinking about how the neon is gonna go on top of it. So I'm like interested to know how you think that out. If that's something you think about like. Um. I used to really kind of think about it a lot early on, but I would really kind of just study what the old guys did in the 30s and 40s and um, try to emulate what what I think their decision would have been on it. But it, it takes a lot of thought to, to try and imagine a piece <clears throat> and then try not to be so rigid that you don't see like a better idea come and you go, oh, okay, it would actually look better like this. A lot of these pieces, I, I sketch them and then I make a transparency of it and blow it up full scale on the wall. But then from going to this size to big, uh, I notice other things about it. And it, I, sometimes I'll halfway through a piece, I'll change a part of the design, um, but it takes a lot of thinking to make the piece Volume, voluminous and then uh, graphics painted onto it and then at the same time keeping in mind that the neon has to go on and um, what's kind of funny about these art pieces is y in the daytime you notice the graphics and at night you the neon takes over so they're actually kind of two works of art in one but uh, it takes a lot of planning to get it right and and I kind of just let it unfold and, and tell me what it wants to do, you know. Are you, any other questions? We want to pass, pass the cube mic over. Thank you. Uh, this might be two questions, but what is the most creative and or unusual piece of neon you've ever seen? Um, ever seen, I, I think just like the whole like, of uh, Las Vegas and stuff just as, as its own body of work, it's, it's really incredible. Um, the, uh, the, the most kind of creative one that 
um, that I've ever worked on. It's, it's hard to even come up with one. Uh, the Mermaid was really fun with the tattoos and stuff. But uh, I think Las Vegas in itself, just as it, the whole city is a neon sign, you know, it, it, and then now the, the neon boneyard has a lot of the examples of, of uh, these old neon signs. I think that's really one of the most creative things in the world is to turn an entire town into a neon sign. I want to I want to start a nightclub called the Neon Boneyard. That's a great name. Yeah, I've thought of a cool. It would be a, a cool to do a nightclub where the chairs and tables and even like in the clear floor, just like neon everywhere, neon signs. The whole back of the bar just be neon and call it the Boulevard. It would I, I would I think that would be really popular. Could <laughs> could you make yourself a neon cowboy hat? Yeah, um, I'm like sure. not not on the wall for yeah. your head. There's a, a neon artist in Austin named Scotty Body Waddy, and he has a, a neon cowboy hat. I feel like we can ask you anything, and you've got a story for us. I don't Scotty. know. I'm, I'm kind of... Scotty, Scotty Body Waddy. Any other questions from the audience? Right here. Out in the middle. I've already got the cube. Don't worry. Okay. I can't see you. I'm sorry. No, it's just right in front of you. Right here. Go, go, go ahead. There we go. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious, what are some of your sources of inspiration for this very unique media? Uh, that's a really good question. <clears throat> I, um, I'm influenced by tattoos a lot, like uh, really graphic images. I kind of liken these to tattoos. They're very personal, they're very graphic, and they start with kind of a sketch that I put on my wall. Um, but I try to just stay open to inspiration when it comes to me and it never happens the same way twice i was in a restaurant in austin a mexican restaurant and i saw a movie poster on the wall with a luchador on it and i just thought wow that's a really powerful graphic image and so i started again boiling it down to its essence this was a whole wrestler full body but what makes a luchador unique is his mask and, and so I boiled it down to just the graphic image of the mask and, and came up with it but um, I, I have inspiration, creative inspiration from a lot of places and the one thing I've learned is to write it down because if I don't copy it immediately I can actually forget and like the next day I'm like what was that I thought of you know so one important thing is that I write it down and I've written them down on paper and my iPhone, and then I've got this job management program on my computer. I put them all in there, and I've got over 100 things that I want to make that I've had ideas for. So, um, but yeah, it, it comes at different times in different ways. Over it, here. Okay. Go for it. I'm not even going to try anymore. Apart from inspiration and the meaning that you put into the science, could you take us through the physical, pro uh, just a process of creating it? You mentioned earlier that bending neon is like a really hard thing. And I realized I don't have appreciation in, of the physical aspect of creating this art. So if you could talk about your process, that would be great. Yeah, my process is from the idea, I, I sketch it out, I, I use gridded vellum and I end up redoing it over and over and go through a lot of really expensive gridded vellum, but that's, that's how I do it. And then I make the transparency blown up on the wall. And then I have to make a neon pattern, a metal pattern, a master pattern, a paint pattern, and uh, an assembly pattern. So a piece like this can take a whole day of just me pushing sharpies around on a on a huge pieces of paper just to get the patterns right. And what's interesting is the neon pattern is done backwards. All all neon patterns are the the reverse image because the only flat surface on neon glass is the face. All of the bends and the penetrating electrodes that go into the sign go the other way so all neon signs are bent in reverse and then put on the sign they're flipped over and put on the sign um but then i give all the patterns to the metal work the metal guy and the 
uh, neon bender. <clears throat> they do their thing while I'm painting the piece, and then I use paint strippers and uh, vinegars and things to kind of weather the sign, and then I use scotch bright pads with water. But, um, and then pick, I, now I actually drop off the, the metal piece to the neon bender, and he's got a guy that assembles it for me. And um, I don't do the assembly or the crating or the metalwork or the neon, someone else does. But neon itself is so fascinating to watch them work. You take straight tubes of glass and you put a cork in one end and then you actually put surgical tubing in the other end and put it in your mouth. And then the guy heats it up, he's got different fires. One's called a ribbon burner and it's really long and that's what makes those long gradual curves. And when that thing gets red hot, it's like he, the, these guys are amazing. They put it on the pattern, but it's got a copper screen between the pattern and the neon so that it doesn't just catch the pattern on fire. And they have like literally seconds to bend this into the shape that it needs to be in before it cools and then they do another section and another section. Then they have to plan ahead like on a double stroke letter. A double stroke letter is like this, a single stroke is just like this. They have to bend half of it and then bend the other half and then bend them together to where they close together and it's, it's fascinating to watch them do that. So then when the neon is bent, they weld the electrodes on each end, their glass little tubes that are capped off with a metal little cone inside with two wires sticking through the back of the glass. Those are welded on and then one of them has a straw, like a glass straw coming through it and um, they attach this neon tube with the, the, the little metal, uh, the, the little glass straw, they attach, they weld it to this glass looks like an evil scientist laboratory, all these valves and different things. It's the bombarder's table. And they hit, they, they hooked wires to the electrodes and put 50,000 volts of electricity into the, to, into the uh, neon tube to purify it. When they do that, it actually burns all of the impurities out of the tube, then they vacuum that out and then they open, they close the, that and open another valve and, and the, the neon tube is under vacuum. They either introduce argon or neon gas into the glass tube and then they, since it's under vacuum, they can heat that little glass straw and it just collapses in and they pull it off and it, it's got the little, it, it just kind of seals up perfectly. Then they put it on a, another transformer that's usually 15,000 volts and they hook the electrodes, uh, the, the, the leads from the transformer on it and it's called burning in. You leave it on the table for a few hours and all of the ions kind of acquaint themselves inside the tube and after that it's ready to go on the sign and work but it is, it is fascinating to watch them do it. And when they bend the neon, it looks so easy. They make it look so easy. You just go, oh, I could do that. No, you can't. It is, it is really, really an art to do. Did you know what kind of mad science you were getting involved in when you started this? No, I didn't. I really, um, I, I had no idea. I, I didn't know how a neon sign worked. I just, um, I just knew what it did to me when I saw one glowing and how it affected me. And, and so it's fascinating to to actually see the process happen. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me because you could have picked up a camera and said, I'm gonna document and, and through that, I'm gonna kind of collect and preserve this stuff. But going into replication and homage and, and learning that craft and then recreating it, it was like a whole nother level. Um, it reminds me, there, there's an artist that I, I really love, Charles S. Anderson, who started doing this replicating old graphic designs. Um, from the mid-century, and eventually he realized the papers those were printed on don't exist anymore. So he started a paper company. He said, wow, we're just going to yeah. make all the paper. You know, it's that level of dedication to saying, it's not enough to preserve or to document. I want to recreate it. I want to bring this thing back. Yeah, I've, um, <clears throat> I've made this piece as close to 
the way they made them in the 1930s and 1940s. I've searched out the, the, the components, like the little white porcelain housings that the neon goes into. They were making them again, and now um, because of LED, uh, those are not even available anymore. But even the tube supports, the little items that hold the neon to the metal backing, those are exactly the same as they made in the 1930s. Um, and I even, I even weather those. I dip them in this blackening solution that kind of makes them look old. Um, but uh, the, uh, and then I also, there's, there's service doors on the side of the sign and they usually just have a metal plate that goes on them, but I've sourced out 1930s Texas license plates, and so those are the service doors. <clears throat> They're really hard to find, but I've, I've found some of those. But uh, the only thing that's different about these pieces is the inside, the transformers used to be really huge and 15,000 volts, and they weighed probably 30 pounds each. The, this is all solid state technology, so the transformer is as big as two little match boxes. It weighs ounces, and it's dimmable. It's, they're only 8,000 volts, but um, that's the only difference. <clears throat> and it's inside the sign, so you don't see it, but um, it really, and they're actually made in California. They're, they're made in Stockton, um, but I've been using them for 10 years and I just completely got out. But it really lightens the sign. These are used in people's homes. And those old signs full of transformers, they, they could be hundreds of pounds of transformers. And they, like five or six transformers don't even weigh a pound or two So, uh, of this solid state kind. So that's the only difference. It's like the iPhone of neon signs in there. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, awesome. it's Moore's Law applies. Okay, so we've got time for one more question. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, hi. Oh, hi. Um, so uh, in the beginning, you talked a little bit about where Neon came from, how it started in Europe. And yeah, um, yeah, you're pointing much pretty in the right direction. Um, and uh, how it came to America and it got this reputation for being kind of seedy and all that. I was just wondering if you knew about kind of the landscape of neon in Europe like today, whether it followed a similar trajectory and like whether there were different kinds of like styles of neon signs in Europe today and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> neon kind of fell out of popularity in a, a lot of Europe. I've traveled around London and it's really rare to see a neon sign, I just get like, oh, I can't believe I just found one, you know. Um, but in Paris, there's not a whole lot of neon still being used. There are other countries, uh, Hong Kong and Japan have really embraced a lot of neon and um, they've kind of made it their own style as well. But neon really kind of didn't didn't have the staying power in, in, in Europe the way, uh, the Americans embraced it. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Todd. Can we get one Thank more you. round of applause for Todd? Thank you. I really, I really am honored to be here. Uh, bef before we wrap up, we also wanted to say thank you. Uh, tonight we have Randall Homan and Al Barna from the S SF Neon Project. Are they in the audience? Can they give a shout out? Woohoo! Woo Thank you guys for coming. So SF Neon is this incredible book that's documented the history of neon here in our own community. They also do guided walking tours. So two things, they have an event coming up on September 22nd at the SF Public Library where they're gonna be talking about neon here in our community. A really great opportunity for everyone to learn more. They've also donated uh, five walking tours to us. So we have five names we're gonna call out right now. Um, and those people can come up afterwards and claim their free SF walking tour. It's for you and a plus one. Uh, so the winner names are Roy Chan, Yaya Shang, Sylvia Terpstra, Dario, Bar Dario Barbone, and Alyssa De Vogel. So come on up here. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, stay tuned, we'll be doing more of these. Have a good night. <laughs>